Hi, I'm Jamie Dixon, and this is three things every acoustic guitarist should try. Um, so basically we've got uh, a few tips and tricks to try if you are an acoustic guitarist and the first thing um, we're going to talk about is capos or capos as they say in the States. Um, I have one here <laughs> that I prepared earlier. Um, <clears throat> most people think of these as um, useful tools for um, bringing your playing into the range of a singer maybe um, but keeping the fingering the same on the fretboard but um, beyond that obvious purpose um, Capos or capos are also useful for other creative reasons. Um, so we're going to look at one particular application today. But before um, we do that, um, I just want to talk briefly about um, choosing one. There are hundreds of models on the market. Um, it's no exaggeration to say. So the only advice I think is worth offering is to try and use or try out before buying several different types for the particular kind of guitar you're playing. Now, um, I brought two along with me today. Uh, one is the G7th Cam Action one, which you just simply pinch it on like that. And then the cam locks it into place and when you want to take it off, there's a little catch. That's very handy. This one here, which is an Ernie Ball model, it relies on a spring and a bit of leverage to do the same job. Um, there's no right or wrong really in all Capo makers or capo makers will tell you that their um, device works equally well across all instruments. One observation I'd like to offer any acoustic guitarist is to try different capos on your guitar because they aren't all equal and some will suit some guitars better than others no matter what they say. Obviously well-made and well-designed ones will work well um, from guitar to guitar but some work slightly better than others and this was certainly my experience with my Martin Triple O. 14 here, it's the Martin Custom guitar. Um, I like both these capos, G7th make really great ones. This one here though, Ernie Ball, um, for some reason just has the edge, um, it sounds better. That sounds a weird thing to say because you think the job of the capo is to just sort of pinch the strings um, in place and then for the fret to sort of sound the note shouldn't really affect the sound. Um, I suspect it's how securely and how snugly particular capo fits on your guitar so um, as I say both of these do a good job one for me does it a little bit better um, so this is the G7th I'm not saying you'll hear a massive difference but um, you can see how easy that's to put on um, but for whatever reason and um, with this particular guitar um, I ended up preferring this one here so um, just a little quick tip there um, if you've got a real main guitar that you use, do try a few different capos with it because um, you might find one is just a little bit better to use. The only thing I'll say about these ones here with um, the lever sticking out the side is um, they do can impede the movement of your hand down towards what is effectively the like the nut would where the nut would be. You've, you've kind of put a capo instead and, and sometimes the one with a bit of big handle on them can be um, a bit restrictive. Um, that said, the actual um, thing I would recommend acoustic guitarists try is to use one not only for um, changing the sort of range that you're playing in to suit a singer but um, one thing that I've noticed as a fingerstyle player is that uh, if you're doing um, nice little technical slightly fiddly fingerstyle stuff um, on an uncapo guitar in a drop tuning like Dadgad which is what this guitar is in That's really nice, um, but if you're looking for something that sounds even more silvery and light and bubbly and sort of flowing like a like a stream, the proverbial stream, um, one little um, tip and or trick you can do, um, this comes from Martin Carthy, I believe, is to just capo at the second fret. Um, it doesn't change the voice of the guitar radically. Capoing on the second fret also leaves the dot markers behaving in, a, in an expectant way. You're not playing between the between the markers, if you know what I mean. Um, and what it does is um, just gives you a, a much lighter, more um, almost uh, almost like a kind of, I won't say mandolin, but just in a higher register that flows really nicely. So I'll play a little lick without the capo. And then we'll put this on at the second fret. Well, 
of a sudden everything becomes lighter, more airy, and uh, it's not better. You might just find it's useful for bringing a kind of lightness to some of your fingerstyle pieces. Um, I find it works especially well with larger bodied guitars um, like Dreadnoughts or even larger Jumbos um, because they have a natural extra bass push that helps um, fill out the airiness of the sound as you sort of capo um, at the second fret. So you might want to match that technique with a with a bigger bodied guitar. Um, as I say, it's not a hard and fast rule, it's just something to try. So, and with that, we'll move on to our second thing to try if you're an acoustic guitarist. <laughs> So the next thing that every acoustic guitarist should try um, is a little tip that has to do with strings. But before we get to the tip itself, um, let's talk a little bit about um, how strings influence the tone of your acoustic guitar. Because let's face it, there aren't too many ways to tweak your tone on acoustic when compared to an electric. Certainly when the guitar is unamplified, changing strings is going to be one of your main ways to tweak the voice of your acoustic guitar more to your liking. Um, if you're new to acoustic guitars completely, um, you might want to start with um, phosphor bronze strings. So phosphor bronze uh, relates to the alloy that the wound strings, that's the darker toned strings, um, are, are, are made of, the, the wrap itself around the core. That has an influence on tone. Phosphor bronze is known for delivering a nice, warm, rounded, poised tone. It's your sort of classic um, ear-friendly acoustic guitar sound. So if you're a bit stuck on where to start, this is a great choice. Um, likewise, if your guitar is very bright and trebly sounding, um, phosphor bronze strings can make it sort of smoother sounding. Um, but if you have the opposite problem, which is um, a bit of a dull sounding guitar, which sometimes happens, then you might want to uh, try what's known as an 80-20 set. So 80-20 is a different um, alloy. And it's known for producing a slightly brighter tone, slightly brighter, livelier, zingier sound. So again, if you've got a guitar where you think the strings or the sound of the guitar is a bit uh, dull, you might want to try these just to give a bit of zing back and definition. Now, if you want to go even brighter still, um, Ernie Ball make a set called aluminium bronze, and that's really zingy and sharp and sort of citrusy, if you want to, if you will. Um, so if your guitar is really suffering from um, a lack of sparkle, you could even go um, as far as using aluminium bronze strings. Um, those aren't the only um, alloy types that strings are made of. A um, couple more that are worth mentioning are Monel strings, which are kind of uh, relate to sort of vintage acoustic tones. You might want to use them for Americana or bluegrass or something like that. Um, well worth a try. They're probably not for everyone. They have a quite a distinctive sound. But if that sort of vintage pre-war sound is what you're after, Monell strings are well worth trying. Again, that's not a brand, it's a sort of alloy formulation, uh, but you'll find them from various makers. Um, which brings us to um, the actual thing that every acoustic guitarist should try, um, which is uh, coated strings. Uh, not all guitarists use coated strings, but um, there are some unique advantages as they offer. And if you're unfamiliar with them, coated strings are essentially a string that has a, a, a kind of almost microscopically thin sheath over it. Um, and the idea behind that is to ex extend string life because the sheath prevents corrosion and ingress of dirt and things like that. But it also has one extra quality, which I think is actually the most valuable thing they offer. Um, which is that they can reduce um, string squeaks and handling noise when you're recording. And um, uh, because they've got this coating, which is quite slick, it just re reduces that kind of eek squeak noise when you're moving between positions. And that can be invaluable just for, for making a, a more smooth and kind of professional sounding recording. So we've actually um, got two guitars here, one with uncoated strings on here, with a very nice set. I think they're Kurt Mangans on this one. Nothing wrong with them, they're great strings. Um, but there's a particular piece I play, which uh, I, there's a little spot in it where, the, where there's a little bit of string squeak that's hard to avoid. So I want to show you the contrast between using an uncoated set on this guitar and um, on this beautiful Taylor here, which has coated strings. Um, you'll hopefully hear the difference in a reduction of string squeaking as I'm playing. So let's start with the Martin, which has the uncoated strings on. Again, nothing wrong with them. They're beautiful sounding strings, but there's this one aspect that uh, 
I think coated strings do better. So let's hear the uncoated strings first. <laughs> So as you can hear, as my finger's sliding down on that one particular spot there, I think it's on the, one of the wound strings, you're hearing a little bit of a string squeak. So let's switch to the Taylor, which as I say has um, coated strings on. And hopefully, although inevitably the sound of the guitar itself is a little bit different, you'll hear that the um, reduction in handling noise or string squeak with the coated strings is, is apparent. So here we go. So it doesn't reduce it completely. You've still got to use your, um, have your wits about you and try and play as gracefully as possible, but there's just a little attenuation of that squeak can be useful. So if you've not tried coated strings before and you're going to the studio, do give it a try because you might just find it adds that extra layer of um, smooth playing and or um, sonics that you want. Okay, so the third thing that every acoustic guitarist should try is different body sizes. Um, acoustic guitar these days, um, the most common style of acoustic guitar you'll see for sale is the Dreadnought style, which is um, yeah, kind of made famous originally by the Martin D28 and D18, used on countless recordings. Um, they have lots of bass, they have um, big square shoulders, they have that classic acoustic guitar outline that if you asked a kid to draw an acoustic guitar, that's what they draw as a dreadnought shape. But there are other types um, to be tried. And so um, we thought we'd just do a quick walkthrough and sonic comparison between different um, body shapes and styles of guitar that you'll come across in the acoustic world and give you a quick playthrough and an idea of um, very broadly the differences in sound. Now, obviously, it's not just body size that influences tone. Um, the top, which is effectively the sound soundboard or the vocal cords of the guitar, if you like, um, or the speaker cone, rather, probably a better analogy, um, that has a big influence on sound. And a great many acoustic guitars have a spruce top, um, very often Sitka spruce top. So um, our um, comparison guitars here today are all spruce topped, with the exception of a Taylor we have in the back there, which is a redwood top. Um, the back and sides also contribute something to the tone. Um, this guitar, which is the Martin 00014, has a mahogany back and sides, which is associated with a softer, rounder tone, arguably. Uh, rosewood is um, another common back and sides material C, which is uh, more associated with piano-like clear highs and well-defined well lows. It's a bit more um, kind of uh, hi-fi, maybe. Someone might describe it as that, but um, uh, woods are a whole massive topic in themselves. So we're just going to try different body sizes. And um, we do have a Dreadnought here today um, to use in the comparison. It's a round-shouldered Gibson J45. Um, that is um, a, a very classic Dreadnought style. But we're going to start with my Martin, which is the Triple O. Um, the Triple O is known by its sort of hourglass-shaped body. And Martin also make uh, double O's, which is just a little bit smaller, and you know single O. Uh, versions of this that are scaled down with um, uh, a, a change in tone as you as you change the body size. Triple O is seen as a really nice um, all-rounder, especially for fingerstyle playing and blues playing. Um, it's very similar to the OM model that Martin make, which also has the same sort of hourglass-shaped body, but it, the OM has a longer scale length, so it has a 25.4 inch scale length as opposed to this one's 24.9 inch scale length. So in practice, that means that the strings are a little bit easier to bend on the triple O with the shorter scale length. Um, and uh, the trade-off is that the OM might have a little bit more sparkle and kind of uh, shimmer and zing um, with its longer scale lengths. Um, it's a kind of case of trying both and seeing which one suits you. But I find this triple O suits me um, down to the ground. So. Without further ado, I'm going to play a little bit of strumming and then I'm going to play a little bit of finger style and then we're going to move to a different body shape so you can hear 
how um, that changes the voice of the guitar. Now, to be um, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, obviously body shape and size is not the only determinant of tone. Um, body woods have a massive amount to do with it as well. Um, this is a has got a spruce top, so the soundboard is made of spruce, and that's very much like the speaker cone of the guitar. Has a big influence on tone. Sitka spruce is seen as a good all-round choice. Uh, it has a mahogany back and sides, which is typically associated with a nice warm, rounded tone. Um, if it were rosewood, which would be another combination you could you could match up on this guitar or this style of guitar, um, you might expect a more piano-like um, tone with um, clear highs and well-defined lows. Again, with body woods is a huge, massive subject in its own right. So we're just going to do a, a very broad um, chop and change between different sizes of body, so you can see what why it's worth um, trying your hand with different sizes of um, acoustic guitar because one might suit your playing style more than others so without further ado i'm going to do some strumming first then a little bit of finger style then we're going to move on to some other classic body shapes um, by other manufacturers <laughs> So that's the Martin Triple O. So what I've got in my hand here is a really nice um, Gibson Custom uh, J45. This is a kind of a, a special edition they've just come out with that's got styling cues from the uh, electric Les Paul Custom, but. Um, Fundamentally, it's a round shoulder dreadnought uh, with X bracing and uh, spruce top and mahogany back and sides. Um, it has a larger, deeper body than the OM, and uh, in practice, what you expect from dreadnoughts is a stronger um, bass push, so a bit more uh, uh, boom in the bass. And um, typically, they make great strummers that are also versatile all rounders that can be used for fingerstyle as well. So um, we'll repeat the same pattern. Uh, with the examples and you can have a listen to the difference in tone. Okay, so hopefully you heard that there's, uh, on the strumming, it has a bit more body and um, depth to it. But when you get into the finger style, uh, arguably the extra bass um, makes it a little bit less sort of nimble sounding and sort of um, light and airy. And there's no reason you shouldn't use it for finger style. And that's not a bad sound in the least. But it's worth just noting those differences, those subtle differences in sound you get as you go up in body size. So. Um, on to our next guitar, which is one of the largest acoustic body sizes you can get, um, and a very famous design, which is the Gibson's J200 Jumbo. Okay, so this is the big daddy of uh, acoustic guitars. 
um, used by people like Elvis uh, in his in his heyday, and um, uh, very much a thought of as a as a big strum along guitar, you know, with a with a big old voice. Um, they can be a bit of a gentle giant though, um, J200s, when they're built really nicely, and they actually can be great for finger style as well. They can have a surprisingly breathy, um, articulate voice at um, lower lower kind of um, playing volumes as well. So um, let's just have a listen and hopefully you'll hear um, how this kind of expands and deepens the voice of the guitar once again, having this lovely great big body here. Um, but you'll hopefully hear that it's not um, you know, useless as a fingerstyle guitar as a result of it going up in size and becoming bigger of voice. So here's the strumming part. <laughs> So again, there's no right or wrong here. There's just different um, emphasis in tone and voice that um, is associated with different body sizes. Yep, um, definitely pay attention to tone woods and how they, they modulate and moderate that sound even further. But um, hopefully you've got an idea of how moving up in body size um, and, the, and the classic body shapes that we've shown here does have its influence on the type of tone you get and the kinds of uses you might want to put these guitars to. Okay, so that was our three things every acoustic guitarist should try. Um, of course, there's many more things that one can experiment with with acoustic guitars, but hopefully that's um, provide some great starting points uh, for your own experimentation. Um, if you liked the video, um, hit the like and subscribe buttons and we'll see you next time for more tips and tricks with electric guitars and acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm.